Your word is truth. Help us to obey. Thank you for the flavor of this meeting this evening. And may each of us, when we leave this place, indeed our spirits might have been fed and our souls revived. For we ask in the name that is above every name, the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated in the presence of our good and gracious God. First of all, I want to <clears throat> thank Bishop Pinder and his dear wife for their kind invitation, the leaders of the church, for their kind invitation to be with you on this seventh anniversary, seventh anniversary in the bishopric. Uh, we appreciate him as a prince in the church. And um, I know you've been taking care of him, so I don't need to tell you about that. <clears throat> what a theme it is for this occasion. I said to him in the back, this is a teaching theme, and everybody who desires to be a leader should be here. Amen. That's what this theme is all about. Amen. An upright leader walking in integrity. I've chosen this evening to speak to you from a, a little passage in Psalm 78. This is a teaching moment for leaders in this leadership theme that we have this evening. Psalm 78, I'm gonna read the final three verses of this psalm. Listen to what the word of God says. <clears throat> Verse 17. He also chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, and Israel, his inheritance. So he, meaning David, shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. I want to use this little passage to talk to you a little bit tonight on this great theme. Whenever you enter public ministry, whenever you enter public ministry, whether you are a pastor or a politician, you are immediately placed under the spotlight of suspicion. Yes. Let me say it again. <laughs> Anytime you enter public ministry, whether you are entering as a pastor or a politician, you are immediately placed under the spotlight of suspicion. There will be those detractors who will dog your steps and question the authenticity of your calling. Yeah. You see, it, did God call him? <laughs> they will question the credibility of your vision. Yeah. They will question the integrity of your motives. And the strength of your leadership skills and your personality. Amen. It all goes with the territory. Right. And everyone who is a pastor in here will agree with me that that is the truth. Yes. Indeed, the church leader finds himself under four great pressures as I see it and as I have experienced in my life as a pastor. Four great pressures. The first one is that there is the pressure of dealing with everyone at every stage of their lives. They expect the pastor to deal with them from conception to birth, from toddler to adult. Everybody expects the leader to be able to address their issues. 
Secondly, there is the pressure of dealing with the brokenness of the society. Everything bad that happens in the community comes to church. And they expect the pastor to deal with it every day. I, I want to tell you this evening that no president or prime minister has a job as tough as that of a pastor. Thirdly, there, there is the pressure on the pastor leader of dealing with members who they tell you what to do. They want to tell you what to do and how to do it. After they watch some television program with some church and they want to bring it to your church. And the pastors say, Amen. It's true. Then there, the fourth one I, I, I think I witnessed too is the pressure of dealing with a growing social arrogance in the society. And when you open your mouth, they ask you, who you think you is? That's what the pressure, that's the kind of pressure the pastor is under because we are living in an age of confrontation and rebellion. Where truth is in a verbal and visible battle. Yet, the church leader, despite all of those pressures, the church leader is arguably the most underrated leader in the society. We have to celebrate ourselves. Yes. 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 Am, I, am I talking sense? Yes. Ain't nobody celebrating you. You are tolerated, yes. but not celebrated. Amen. Amen. The church leader is often vilified by those who do not understand church leadership. And almost, almost always, the church leader is misdiagnosed when he tries to be God's man and wield the sword of truth. Amen. They don't want you to talk truth. No. And so, as we gather this, this evening, the question on the table must be, how can one be an upright leader? and walk in integrity because we are celebrating one this evening according to the testimonies we are celebrating a leader who is upright and who walks in integrity so what does the Bible say about that kind of leader first of all from the text that I read to you we learn that an upright leader walking in integrity recognizes that he was chosen by God and not man. That's my first point. An upright leader walking in integrity recognizes that he was chosen by God and not man. The text says he, meaning God, also chose David his servant. An upright leader recognizes that having been chosen by God just as a book needs an author and a poem needs a poet, so does he need his God. Because God is the one who chose him. God is the one who called him. God is the one who consecrated him. And it is God who fuels him and fires him to do the work. But when you were chosen by man, they expect you to be their clone. They expect you to be their puppet. You have to be selective in what you say and how you say it. But when you are chosen by God, you can take a stand anytime and anywhere without fear because you are not in anyone's pocket. Come on, sir. You are not beholden to anyone but God. So when you speak, you are bold. Because you are not on assignment for man. You are on assignment for God. 
And you will be under the protection of God even when they withdraw their tithes. Because you know some members just do that. Anytime you touch their sin, they stop giving. I know I'm talking the truth. No one can touch you when you know God called you. No many leaders this evening cannot speak truth to power because they have been compromised by alignment and lifestyle. I have never heard anything about this man. People who walk in integrity, you don't hear nothing about. And if you hear something, it's a lie. Because they got to try to find something yes. 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 To, put on you. to put on you. However, an upright leader is firm in his morality and he refuses to give up his integrity for security because of his calling and recognition that it is dangerous to succeed if you plan it. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> it is dangerous. To succeed if you plan it. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always better to fail in a cause that will ultimately succeed than to succeed in a cause that will ultimately fail. Yes, sir. My God. I have discovered that when God chooses you, you don't have to worry about being successful. No. Because true success and sufficiency is not from man, it's from God. Yeah. By the way, by the way, when you're chosen by man, success is determined by the kind of building you got. Amen. By your education attainment. Yeah. I am PhD, I am this and I am that. It, it, it is determined by your social acceptance. Yes. It is determined by your economic ability. Yes. But when you are chosen by God, leaders hear me well, yes. when you are chosen by God, success is determined by the people that you produce. Yes. Not how si the size of your building, not the size of your budget, not who invites you to their party. It's about the people that you produce. You can have a thousand members in your church and not be successful. And you can have five. And if they are growing in Christ, you are successful. Here's my second point. My first point is that the upright leader walking in integrity recognizes that he was chosen by God, not man. Not man. Secondly, the second point we find in this text is that an upright leader walking in integrity remembers that he is a servant. Notice that what the text says. The text says he chose David his servant, his slave. When you become a leader in God's church, you become a slave. Yes, sir. You see, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, true Christian ministry is not about self-promotion. No. It's not about self-projection. It is not about self-aggrandizement. It is about servanthood because we have been chosen. You didn't choose yourself. No matter the people voted, you did not choose yourself. Because God can stop any vote. Despite the fact in our churches today there is the, what I call the cult of celebrity. The cult of celebrity has entered the church. The concept, ladies and gentlemen, of celebrity is not in the scriptures. 
my God. There are no superstars in the kingdom. There is only one famous one in the kingdom. His name is Jesus Christ. And listen to what the only famous one in the kingdom said. The greatest among you. The greatest among you shall be a servant. You know, some people don't go to certain meetings because it depends on who preach it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The cult of celebrity. When God says, you see, it is important, it is important, church. And for those of you who are interested in leadership in the church, you've got to understand this. Greatness in the kingdom is not about ascending. Greatness in the kingdom is about descending. So if you want to be a big shot blinging, don't become a servant of God. Because this... The wrong concept, people believe they're climbing. You don't ascend, you descend. You see, ministry is is, is about a total giving of yourself to the cause of Christ. It is not promoting self. It is promoting Christ. Oh, I wish all Christian leaders could hear the word of God. You know, you notice some of them? When they're preaching, they come half hour late. Make a grand entrance. Like they from Hollywood or some. With their entourage. Like they're some superstar. We are servants. As servants of Christ, we have nothing to worry about because slave owners are slaves. Owners are responsible for their slaves. I ain't got to worry about nothing because Jesus is responsible for me. The message to every leader is that as you trust and obey your master, you do not have to worry or give up because we have been bought with a price and all of our needs will be met. It's truly a privilege to serve God, I tell you. And to be a fool for his sake. Mm-hmm. Paul says, yes, we are the scum mm. of the earth. Yes, you, can, you can imagine calling the pastor scum. And that's what Paul describes us as. The scum mm. of the earth. Thirdly, an upright leader walking in integrity remembers where God brought him from. Listen to the text. From the sheepfolds. In other words, he was brought from the pen. Listen to me. If any leader ever gets the idea that it was he who got himself where he is, he has failed the leadership test. He is not to be trusted. Because an upright leader never forgets where he came from. My God. In my in my over forty years of preaching, I have preached in Peru, in the UK, in America, throughout the Bahamas. I've earned the highest level of education. I have a terminal degree, bachelor's degree, masters, two masters. A doctorate. In my family life, I have two wonderful sons. But my prized possession 
is my 40 years of marriage to the most wonderful woman in the world. Amen. That's my prized possession. She ain't here tonight. She's in Maryland. She's gone to a get ready for a conference. I join her tomorrow. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah, preachers, preachers can't wait. <laughs> Sometimes you get me upset now. Don't, don't fool yourself. 40 years don't mean everything was calm. <laughs> Sometimes you got on, get on my nerves. Sometimes I got a frown on my face. But that's my prized possession. Amen. God has kept me for 40 years. But I will never forget that it was God my provider. Yes. Yes, it was God my strong tower. Yes. It was God my healer. Yes. Who led me from the poverty of Crooked Island. Yes. And the grip of asthma. Yes. It is God who has given me the brain power to exegete a text. Yes. It is God who has given me the ability to communicate his truth. I will always be a crooked island boy from poor parents. Yes. Always be. Yes. With my sister sitting right over there. My 75-year-old sister who's been like a mother to me. Who left school early to take care of her little brother because I suffered from asthma. And she has kept me. Can't forget her. I will not always be a Crooked Island boy, a mother who was a subsistence farmer. And a father who went under contract in the United States and worked as a laborer on the farms and picked up cans to provide for his family. I cannot forget the water and bread that I had for lunch from school, for school. And sometimes a dilly. I can't forget. I had no shoes to go to school in. But look at me now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Look at me now. I am teaching in the great cathedral. I mean, man, this is wonderful. The great cathedral of St. John's. I have been chosen by the King of Kings yes. to lead some of his people at Christ Community Church. Yes. Yes. I can now afford a few pairs of shoes. Yes. Yes. And I could buy a pound of sausage and eat all by myself. Yes. <laughs> but I will never get big headed because I have been chosen. I am not self-made despite going to school and learning a couple of things out of the book. I was made by the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. And let me tell you something, people, those of you who want to be leader. Whenever you recognize that you have been chosen by the Lord, it brings stability to your life. But when you forget from whence you came, you are a target for the temptation of the enemy. Yes. And your usability by God is diminished. Amen. Trust me. Amen. Trust this 66-year-old man speaking to you. You, when you recognize that where God brought you from, yes. it stabilizes your life. But when you act like you are all that, yes. you become a target yes, for the devil. Well, well. That's why you don't hear Bishop Carrington pin the name. Amen. Because he recognizes where he came from. Amen. Fourthly, an upright leader walking in integrity learns through following. Amen. Look at verse 71. From following the youths that had young, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, 
and Israel his inheritance. Those of you who want to be leaders, let me tell you something. Upright leaders do not jump into leadership. Amen. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. Upright leaders walking in integrity don't jump into leadership. They have a track record of following. Yes. Ask your bishop. Yes. Lots of people look at, at, at pastoral leadership and all they see is glamour. That's all. That's all. You got a parking spot. You got anniversary every year. And all they think about the pastor, oh, that's glamorous. It's sexy. It all looks sexy. Yes. But may I tell you, leading in the church of Jesus Christ is a costly job of self-renunciation and struggle. Yes. People don't know the trouble we see. Yes. In David's life, God used solitude. In David's life, God used obscurity. In David's life, God used monotony, doing the same thing over and over every day with them sheep. God used reality and God used a female sheep to teach David leadership skills. My God. Following. You don't get in the palace without first being in the prison of following. You want to be a leader? Follow a leader. You might be smarter than the leader with your degree, but you want to be a real leader, an upright leader, walking in integrity? Follow a leader. Even Jesus followed a leader. Jesus didn't come on the scene until he was 30 years. What do you think he was doing? Following leaders. And he's God. He's God. Upright leaders do not jump into leadership. Before you become an upright leader and a trusted leader, you have to learn to follow. And because David followed the female sheep, he learned compassion. Yes. He learned how to care. Yes. He learned how to be soft at times. He learned how to protect. He learned how to handle loneliness. Yeah. He learned how to be faithful in little things. Yeah. He learned how to handle obscurity. So much he learned it that when they came to look for the king, they didn't even recognize David as part of it. That's what God does. Yes. When you learn to follow, he will pick you from among the rest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because following the sheep in the hills of Judah prepared David for the halls of the palace. Yes. His destiny. Upright leaders know how to follow. Are you all with me? Yes. Fifthly, an upright leader walking in integrity, the text says, lead, I, I put it this way, leads people from his heart and not his head. Amen. Notice what the text says. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. It's all in the text. It's all in the text. This should be a seminar. I know you all came to, glory to God, hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> and you all, and you all, you all sang one of my favorite songs tonight. The Lord is my life and my salvation. But an upright leader walking in integrity leads his people from his heart and not his head. That's what the text says. Did you read that in the text? Yes. So he shepherded them according to the integrity of his heart. I didn't make that up. It's in the text. Yes, yes, yes. 
Ladies and gentlemen, hear me tonight. God is more concerned about who you are than what you do. Amen. Let me say that again. Amen. God is more concerned about who you are than what you do. Amen. Because if who you are does not please him, then what you do is virtually useless. My Lord, that's right. The newspaper may capture you, the political people may capture you, but as far as God is concerned, you ain't do nothing yet. Our text shows that upright leaders build their character first. Amen. Notice that the first statement about David's performance as king was not about his ability. It was not about his military accomplishments. It was not about his victory over Goliath or Saul. But his in. Why? Because character matters to God, Pastor Hensie. True leadership is not about eloquence. How good you can talk. No. It's not about profundity and marketing. Because you can market yourself in such a way that you can have this place full up. And God is displeased. Amen. True leadership is about integrity, which is being the same inside and out. In a person of integrity, there is no difference between his private life and his public life. You don't fake this thing. Amen. You and your wife with your big hat on coming and suddenly you just cuss at one another. No. no. <laughs> your private life and your public life must be consistent. Amen. You say what you mean and you mean what you say. What you declare, you live because character matters to God. By the way, when you die, the only thing you can take with you is your character. Amen. Because when you stand before God, God is going to judge you in four things. Your deeds, your declarations, your desires, and your dependability. That's all. Your deeds, the things you have done. Your declarations, the words you have used on Facebook and WhatsApp and Twitter, all of them coming into account. It's about your deeds, your declarations, your desires that your pastor can't see. It's about your dependability when you are given an assignment and you can't perform. And you're full of excuses. Yes. You know what an excuse yes. is? My definition of an excuse is this. An excuse is the skin of a lie stuffed with a reason. That's what an excuse is. People in the church are full yes. of excuses. Yes. By the way, a trusted leader shepherding with the integrity of heart means that he sees as his people sees. He hears as his people hears. He feels as his people feel. He does not ask his people to do anything that he is not prepared to do. Amen. If you are a trusted leader, if you are an upright leader, if you walk in integrity, you cannot ask your people to do something that you are not prepared to do. That's why I love this theme. Amen. This is serious stuff, and all how we need leaders like this today. Yes. Why must he be willing to do it? Because the leader is called to lead and to model for his people. 
can't preach on giving and tithing and then the offering pan come around. I don't give nothing. I can't take my tithes and go on vacation. You a thief. How can you take the Lord's money and put on your car? That's a thief. And pastors, y'all got to watch these thieves collecting your offering. You don't put a thief around your money. People who collect your offering should be tithers and givers. I'm up in your business. <laughs> a leader walking in integrity must be real with his people. Yes. And be willing also to admit that he has flaws. Amen. You see, sometimes, you know, we as leaders, we act as if yes. we got it all together, you know. We, I just rob my wife sometimes. I just get mad at my wife sometimes. Sometimes I don't want to talk. And I use survival language. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk. Tells you we have flaws. But one thing you must be big enough to ask for help. A leader who fakes it and pretends that he has no struggle is a hypocrite. Because we all have struggles. And you know why we have struggles? So that we can depend on Jesus. If you had no struggle, you would not need Jesus. So stop faking it. You're struggling with some marked people to help you. Because somebody in the audience went through the struggle you're going through right now. By the way, that's why we as the people of God must learn to share our struggles. Yes. Don't act so holy yes. that you prevent people from being helped Amen. because of your struggle. Yes. Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 6 and 3 that anyone who thinks himself to be something when he is nothing deceives himself. Don't you ever think you are so deep that you can't fall? Let me, let, me, let me hurry on. Let me hurry on. It's now almost 9 o'clock. We're in class. You're in class. Thank you, man. You know, I, I could say you for a couple of hours. Because <laughs> this, this is my lane, you know. Teaching is my lane. Another important point is that an upright leader moves by the spirit and not by manipulation. Manipulation is witchcraft. I see a lot of it in churches today. In an effort to get a desired response and especially money out of people. They use manipulation. Yes. Making promises that they cannot deliver. My God. It's witchcraft. Yes. God is not pleased. Because quick success is not going to last. God will expose. Amen. Yes, he will. I said it before. It is a dangerous thing to succeed when you plan it. Amen. Because if you are called by God, if you are chosen by God, if you are consecrated by God, God is the source of your firing and your funding. Let me give you one more point and I'll be out of your way. I know church people. <laughs> See, my sister up here, Chris, Chris Miller's sister up here, she says she's taking notes, but she's saying, I'm ready to go home right now. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, let me, leave, let me give you one more from this text. Finally, an upright leader walking in integrity leads from a position of knowledge, 
not hype. Notice what the text says. He guided them by the skillfulness of his what? Of his hands. You want to be a leader? You can't just be hyping up people. Today, tomorrow is your, yes, it's your time. This is your season. <laughs> like David. You see, 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 let me tell you something. Our pulpits have become motivational centers and not centers of truth. And that's why people ain't changing. That's why people get up and go to the next church. Because they want a motivational talk. They don't want the truth. And if you are preaching the truth, your pews are going to be empty. But that's all right. Because success is not in the numbers. It's in the quality of people that you produce. Yes. Don't you get don't get mesmerized by these places with all these people hanging from the ceiling? Smoke from the pulpit. And all it's a show. David, like David, an upright leader must some, have something in his head and in his hands. He must be cerebral and skillful, creative and innovative because the times demand it. He can't be one depending on excitement and entertainment to lead God's people. Because wherever a leader depends on excitement and entertainment, he becomes a manipulator. Can't preach without the music behind the Come on now. Sing to me. I feel my health coming around. Preach the truth. That's all you need. The drawing is not by my preaching, it's by the Spirit of God. So once I preach, I sit down. The upright leader must be able to apply truth because today's society is smart, but they lack wisdom. Today's society have issues. They have questions that need to be answered. And a motivational talk ain't going to cut it. By the way, preachers, I mean, if you want to be a motivator, go call, call Les Brown and Tony Robbins them, man. We are not called to be Les Brown and Tony Robbins. We are called to be men of God. Yes. Preaching the word of God. Yes. Yes. Leaders are not going to get away with flaming people. With only motivational talk. I said it before. The church has become pulpits with nice talks. But void of truth. We must have something in our heads to give to our people that would result in liberation and transformation and reconciliation with God and man. There can no longer, church, 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 there can no longer be cleverness to get people's attention. We have to stop playing on people's emotions and use of gimmicks. There can be no mishandling of the scripture or tampering with the meaning. Teaching, teaching, and our preaching must be from your intimate knowledge of God, your time with God and His Word. 
So that in the midst of the madness of the culture, you don't lose the mission of the church. And lots of preachers have missed yes. the mission of the church. Yes, the church exists to do two things, win souls and build souls. Yes, sir. That's all it exists for. Win souls and build souls. That's what Jesus left the church to do. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Teaching them. Yes. Not what T.D. Jake said. Teaching them whatsoever I have taught you. Yes, sir. Don't miss that. Because a lot of people are teaching what other people say. As opposed to what God says. Nowadays you buy your sermons. It is Teaching must be from an intimate knowledge of God and his word so that you never, I said it a while ago, you never lose the mission of the church in the midst of the madness in this world in which we are living in. Yes. C.I. Lewis says when the whole world, C.S. Lewis said when the whole world is running toward a cliff, the upright leader runs in the opposite direction. Yeah. And he is prepared to be called any name and every name but a child of God. Ain't that true? Anytime you stand against the word, they call you homo. You speak against homosexuality, you homophobic. You intolerant. That's what the world does. They want you to go exactly where they're going. But when you decide, no, I'm not going that way, they got all kinds of names for you. But stand firm, pastors. Because we are the last bastions of truth. This whole world is going crazy. Let me leave you now. I've said enough. The call of this dark hour is for a different kind of leader. And as your theme suggests, an upright leader walking in integrity. And so we are celebrating an upright leader who walks in integrity. Carrington Pinder, as I know him, is one who remembers that he was chosen by God and not man. He is one who remembers that he is a servant. He is one who remembers where God brought him from. He is one who has learned from following. Amen. And the fellow he followed was in it a long time. But he followed. Yes, he did. Yes. And look at him now. The bishop of the church. Yes. The prince of the church. Yes. Harrington Pinder is one who shepherds God's people from his heart Amen. and not his head. He is one who leads from a position of knowledge and not hype. I know, I hear him, I listen to him when he preaches. It's knowledge, not hype. You always try to get him to do hype, but he is knowledge, not hype. Why, Pastor, oh, Jesus? <laughs> As I close. <laughs> As I close. As I close, Chris, sister. <laughs> As I close tonight, may I ask each of you just two questions. If you were stripped of your titles, would people still follow you? If you were stripped of your title, would people still follow you? A second question. Knowing what you know about yourself, would you follow you? I'm serious. Knowing what you know about yourself, 
would you, <laughs> would you follow you? Bishop, I thank you for being a quiet but powerful voice in the nation of the Bahamas. You see, your silence is power. I want you, and I, I know the people in this town, you know. I don't listen to the noisemakers. I look at the quality of people. Amen. People who walk in integrity, not walk in noise. Amen. I watch you. I thank you for being a quiet but powerful voice in the nation of the Bahamas promoting liberation. Yes, 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 yes. Transformation yes, yes. and reconciliation through the gospel. You preach the gospel. Yes. So Bishop, it's my prayer that if you die before Christ returns, the epitaph on your heavenly tombstone will read as said of David in Acts chapter 13 and verse 36. Bishop Carrington Pinder served his generation by the will of God. God bless you, my brother. What a word. Come on, let's give God a clap and a praise. I enjoyed every bit of it to the point where I forgot I was leading the service. Amen. Rich word. Amen. We're going to have him come back again to pray for this honoree and his beautiful wife. Amen. Congregation stand as Bishop Cunningham comes back to pray for the honoree. Amen. you turn all of your hearts toward our honorees tonight? Your prayer, as I lead, you pray for them as well. God, our Father, how we thank you for bringing Carrington Pinder and his wife into the kingdom for such a time as this. God, I thank you because it was you who chose them. It was you who called them. It was you who consecrated them. And it is you who will fuel them as they walk this journey. God our Father, we thank you for the name of Carrington Pinder. Lord, he has a good name in this community. He has, oh God, your hand upon him. And so, Lord, I pray for them as a couple this evening that you will strengthen them in a special way. Grant unto them extra grace for the journey. That they will not turn to the left or to the right, but they will look straight in the eyes of Jesus. So that at the end of the day, they would be able to declare we have fought a good fight. We have finished the course. We have kept the faith. God, I pray that when Carrington Pinder and his dear wife, Sister Sabrina, Dr. Sabrina, when they stand in your presence, they will hear those words from your lips, well done. God, give them the capacity to do it. May the winds always be at their backs. May the road always rise up to meet their feet. May the weapons that have been formed against them not prosper. 
May the tongues that have been opened up and spoken against them be condemned because they are your servants. They are righteous. Lord, lead them, guide them, protect them, give them everything that they need as they serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.